So, without further ado, will you please help me welcome Desai Eric Reiser. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start off by thanking the organizers of this wonderful event for having me. Thank you to um, everybody who worked so hard to put together an event like this. I can tell you, having organized certainly nothing of this size myself, but having organized conferences and various events, it takes a lot of work. Um, I think we should first probably give a hand to the people who have done that hard work. So. I guess they, they sort of told me when I came up here that I should probably try to introduce myself first, but I mean, I think everything was pretty much said. I'm not sure what else I need to say. Um, I do this work independently. What that means, I mean, and that's important to me, and I kind of stress the word independent when I'm you know, asked to speak or uh, to provide a description, because what that means is nobody pays me. So because nobody pays me, nobody gets to tell me what to say. Nobody gets to say. Nobody gets to say, well, this subject is off limits. This subject you shouldn't talk about, or maybe you should focus on this or that. That is part of how the system works. And if you're part of that system, unfortunately, you're forced to play that game. And so when I say that I'm independent, what I really mean is that when you're hearing me say something, that's what I think, and that's what I mean, and there is no double game in my language. So, talking about Eritrea and talking about the issues that, that I focus on, I, um, I often use the term anti-imperialism. And anti-imperialism, I think, is a description of the ideology. It's certainly not something I came up with. There's a long history of that term. Um, but I think it bears a little bit closer analysis what exactly that means. And in order to do that, you have to define what imperialism means. To say you're against something, let's, let's be clear about what that something is. And what that something is, is not what the media tells you that it is. It's not what the corporate media, the mainstream media, or even the pseudo-alternative foundation-funded human rights media, or what have you, tells you that it is. They'll try to tell you that there are multiple empires in this world and that they're all competing with each other. But this is false. I think that anybody who puts time and effort into this sort of analysis can understand that really there is one global empire, one globalized empire. It has bases in Washington, on Wall Street, in London, in Paris, in many parts of the world, in Saudi Arabia, in Israel, in many places. And this global empire we could call an empire of finance capital, of neoliberal capitalism, whatever you want to say. There are many terms to describe what it is. But this empire, I think, needs to be understood as something that is not operating in the way that empires necessarily historically have. That is to say, it controls or significantly influences many, many, many organizations, myriad organizations, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, Continental Development Banks, major transnational global corporations, all are part of one system, one system with many complex interlocking parts. And these parts don't always speak to each other. They don't always work together. Oftentimes, they're at cross interests. But ultimately, it is one cohesive system. And I think that part of what we need to understand about this system is how it operates in what we would call the Global South. And what they would like to do, and part of where Eritrea fits into this question, is basically controlling and dictating and influencing the course of development. They want to tell you how you're supposed to develop yourself. You don't get the right to develop in however your own country sees fit. You have to develop according to their rules, according to their practices. And that is 21st century imperialism. In other words, what the empire wants to do is it wants to maintain and expand 
its global hegemony, or in another phrase, perhaps global domination. That's what empire is about. And this is really an extension of a system that's been around for many centuries, isn't it? I mean, in a sense, what we're really talking about, I think, is the logical product of, on the one hand, colonialism, which anybody who knows anything about African history understands perfectly well, and capitalism. And it is the marriage of colonialism and capitalism. And that's how 21st century imperialism operates. We could even call it neo-colonial capitalism. But the question is, what are the tools of this empire, of this imperial system? How does it operate? So I know that I'm a bit limited on time here, so I can't really go into all of these specifics, because honestly, you need to spend at least a semester or a year in a course to really go into that. But let me just break it down into a couple of categories. Let's begin first with political tools that it uses. Institutions, such as the United Nations, the International Criminal Court, the European Union, the G7, many other institutions that are dominated by this system with its ruling establishment. There are regional political institutions as well in which the empire really has massive influence. The Organization of American States in Latin America, ASEAN in Asia, even to a large extent the African Union. So what you're seeing then is that it uses these various international institutions and it uses compliant governments. Governments that it can make into proxies, into puppets. Of course, I think the Eritrean community understands perfectly the puppet government nature of Ethiopia, of the role that Ethiopia has played of the role that Ethiopia has played for imperialism, certainly in the last 25, 30, 40 years. So aside from political tools, there's economic tools that you need to be clear about on how they operate. The International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization. These institutions operate in the interests of this global system. Private banks, which are indeed also globalized, you know, HSBC, Barclays, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, we all know many, many of these uh, banks and other corporations, and they use one of their principal weapons is debt. And the issuance and maintenance of debt forces these countries into a never-ending cycle of debt service, debt servitude, debt slavery, we could say. You never get out of that cycle. Once you take on the loan, you then have to take new loans to pay back the original loan and new loans on top of that, and you're in this endless cycle that so many African countries have found themselves in. <coughs> sanctions. Economic warfare is really what sanctions should be called, because that's what it is. And when a country is sanctioned, it's not simply to tell that country what to do, it's to demonstrate to that country the price that it has to pay to be independent. And I think this is also something Eritrea has dealt with significantly. <laughs> so we have political and economic tools. There's also military tools. The militaries of the neo-colonial power, the US, the UK, France, they also have their subgroupings, AFRICOM and the like. Internationalized military structures, such as NATO and its many partnerships and sub-partnership projects. Anybody who knows the destruction and savagery that was wrought on Libya understands perfectly the role of NATO. You have, and I'm, you know, I, I unfortunately, I'm not going to refer to some of the comments that were made with the previous presentations, but you have these NGOs, so-called human rights organizations, who work in the interests of these very same institutions, who basically operate as a weapon of this same system. Now, this is not to say that everything that they do is false. Not everything they say is a lie. But everything comes with an agenda, with a political agenda. And if they go against the interests of that agenda, they cease to exist. And there are many examples of that. So when they come and tell you, well, this organization says that human rights is A, B, and C, what they're really saying is, you better do X, Y, and Z, or else you'll pay the price.
And then you also have the foundation funded, what I would call pseudo alternative media. And these operate in an interesting way because they present themselves as outside of the mainstream. And yet, interestingly, on some of the most difficult topics, they somehow are always on the same side as imperialism. So if you look at the war in Libya, for example, you had a lot of these so-called left progressive news outlets, media outlets, which presented themselves as interested in development, interested in the struggle for independence, and, and yet they essentially mirrored the same narrative that CNN and Fox and all of the rest of them were saying. And the reason is because they come out of that very same system. So those same institutions, those same individuals that fund these so-called human rights organizations also fund many, many media outlets. Finally, you have cultural weapons that are used, and this is also really important. They like to talk a lot about so-called values. They want to tell you your values, and they want to say that there are these universal values, and if you have a different opinion, a different perspective based in your own culture, derived from your own history, they like to tell you you're wrong. You don't have a right to see it differently, to see your own progress differently. They also use what I would call cultural exports, entertainment, sports, fashion. All of these things are perfectly fine in and of themselves, but notice the way that they're used, what objective they ultimately have. And you'll see that, in fact, they are part of that very same system. Now, I don't want to go into an endless dissection of all of these individual little things. I just want to say why I'm outlining all of this to begin with. And that is mainly because I think it is important to understand the complexity of these institutions and these forces that, to a large extent, are arrayed against Eritrea. This is a global system that sees in Eritrea a threat. A threat for a number of reasons, because a country that won independence for itself on the battlefield with lives, with blood, and paid a tremendous price for that, has decided to develop itself without listening to anybody else, doing it on its own, doing it its own way. And the point of this is it frightens them. They don't like countries that will do what they believe is best, rather than doing what they're told. But the challenges that Eritrea faces as a result of the many years of war, as a result of sanctions, as a result of all of these vast weapons that the imperial system has arrayed against it, things like food security, agricultural development, health care, access to vaccines, preventative treatment, HIV AIDS reduction, infrastructure development, education, all of these things, you'll never hear them talked about as quote unquote human rights, even though, aren't those the fundamental human rights? And isn't that what Eritrea is building? So you'll have people who will come on the stage who will come and speak to you and they'll tell you, well, things are good and, and improving in Eritrea, but how come human rights is such a problem? And I would respond, you mean the Millennium Development Goals that Eritrea has achieved? You mean access to clean drinking water, to food security, to agricultural development, to infrastructure development, and to all of these things? Do those not also count as human rights? This is a fundamental question that needs to be posed to this entire so-called nonprofit, so-called human rights complex. Ask them that, and they don't have an answer for you, because their conception of human rights is human rights as they dictate them to you, not as you believe them to be. And that's the important point about this. But again, the question is, so what? What's the big deal? Eritrea is not a terribly large country. You heard people on this very stage saying, well, it's not so strategically important. They don't care so much about Eritrea. But the question is, so then why do they care so much? Why do they want to destroy the country? Because the answer, I think, is quite clear, it's quite obvious. Because Eritrea presents a dangerous, 
good example. So I, I want to point out, um, in 2007, there was a widely read article that came out in the, in the, excuse me, the Los Angeles Times, one of the biggest papers in the U.S. The headline read, Eritrea aspires to be self-reliant, rejecting foreign aid. Now the article began with the following sentence, I'm quoting it directly, quote, this struggling, low-profile nation is doing something virtually unheard of in Africa. It's turning down foreign aid, close quote. Now I want you to think just for a second what exactly is being said. That Eritrea is doing something, or this is of course eight years ago now, that Eritrea was doing something unheard of, rejecting aid. In other words, Eritrea said, our national development is in our own hands and no one else's. And because they said that, they put a target on their back because they took away one of the most potent weapons that the imperial system has for controlling nations, and that is aid. Eritrea's president explained after rejecting a $200 million aid package from the World Bank, he said, quote, 50 years and billions of dollars in post-colonial international aid have done little to lift Africa from chronic poverty. African societies are crippled societies. You can't keep these people living on handouts because that doesn't change their lives. That's what he said. He said it's... Now you have to understand that when you make a statement like that, you automatically make yourself into the enemy for this system. It's not very difficult to figure out why they hate Eritrea why they make Eritrea into the vicious monster, quote unquote, North Korea of Africa, or whatever. And don't get me started on that stupid <laughs> phrase. Because I'll talk to you about North Korea too, but that's a separate issue. Such independence that Eritrea shows is not exactly applauded by neo-colonial countries who use debt as a means of controlling nations that present themselves as independent. Are you independent when you're dependent on aid? You've seen all over the continent of Africa, literally from the beginning of the post-colonial period, that when you're dependent on aid, independence is a facade. It doesn't really exist. The great African revolutionary leader Thomas Sankara famously said, quote, Imperialism is a system of exploitation that occurs not only in the brutal form of those who come with guns to conquer territory. Imperialism often occurs in more subtle forms, alone, food aid, blackmail. We are fighting this system that allows a handful of men on earth to rule all of humanity. And they murdered him. Thomas Sankara was removed and killed for precisely that sort of position. And this is the point, though, that Sankara so skillfully articulated, and this is what Eritrea has been doing, transforming itself into something of a national ideology of liberation in terms of development, and this is what they cannot allow. That 2007 article in the LA Times, they said, quote, the self-reliance program began a decade ago, but accelerated sharply in 2005. Relying on its meager budget and the conscription of about 800,000 of the country's citizens, the program so far has shown promising results. Now this is eight years ago. We know what kind of results this program has shown up to today, and it's staggering. The article went on to say that these results are measured on a variety of UN health indicators, including life expectancy, immunizations, and malaria prevention. Eritrea scores as high and often higher than its neighbors, including Ethiopia and Kenya. It might be one of the most ambitious social and economic experiments underway in Africa. Now consider for a second, if Eritrea, isolated, sanctioned, demonized, deprived of foreign investment to a large extent, made into the boogeyman of Africa, 
outperforms puppet governments in Ethiopia and neighboring countries such as Kenya with all of the aid and all of the corporations and all of the money, doesn't that tell you something about what Eritrea is achieving? You know, since 2007, Eritrea has continued to make great strides and progress despite a global economic downturn. And I just want to say, you have a global depression since 2008. And Eritrea has suffered in, in certain ways. If you look at economic indicators, they're not as good as maybe they could have been if the global economy would be better. But in that time, Eritrea is the only country in Africa to reach its Millennium Development Goals for 2015. Roughly 98% vaccine and immunization rate, significant reductions in malaria, HIV, AIDS, diarrhea, other preventable diseases, which literally devastate other African countries. Anybody know how many children die in Africa of these preventable diseases? And that is not happening in Eritrea. I wonder why. Reduced infant mortality by two-thirds. Reduced maternal mor uh, mortality by nearly 80% since independence. That's only 25 years. Now there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, young women in this audience. And understand that what's happening for young women in Eritrea is almost non-existent on the African continent. They are a fundamental part of the program for development. Women's education is included in all aspects of development. And that's important. And this is something that these supposed human rights organizations will not talk about. Why? They seem so interested in gender equality, and yet when it comes to Eritrea, a secular country that is able to develop both for men and women, not discussed. I wonder why. Access to health care and clean drinking water, many other things that I don't have time to go into, but we could look at all of the numbers. We could talk about 99% vaccination rate for one-year-olds. We can talk about doubling population with access to electricity, all of these things. None of this qualifies as so-called human rights. And the reason is because it goes against the dominant narrative. It goes against the institutions that want to control Eritrea because they don't have the excuse that Eritrea doesn't care about human rights. Because it seems to me, from my little old independent perspective, that Eritrea is deeply focused on the most important human rights. What Eritrea has been doing is working to develop the independent capacity to feed itself to feed its children, to educate its future generations to the greatest extent possible, given conditions. So the question then is, what is the point of all this talk about development? The reason, why am I standing up here spending all this time talking about that? The reason is because I want to situate Eritrea within two, what I would consider to be interrelated but equally important contexts. On the one hand, the struggle of post-colonial Africa for independence, on the other hand, the anti-imperialist struggle globally. And this is important, because no matter how many times they use this ridiculous phrase, and you always hear it, I don't know why, it's like a talking point, they don't say Eritrea, they say tiny Eritrea. They love to say tiny Eritrea. But the reason is not because of Eritrea's land mass, there are plenty of countries much, much smaller than Eritrea. Exactly. The reason they say tiny Eritrea is because as powerless, as irrelevant, as a fly buzzing around their head, a nuisance. The reason that I wanted to say that we situate Eritrea in this context is because the implications of what it means for Eritrea to be in this struggle for post-colonial independence and anti-imperialist struggle. It is because those countries that have found themselves in that position are often victimized, attacked, destroyed. Take a look at Libya in 2011. Take a look at what Libya was doing, many similar things. 
Human Development Index was the highest in Africa, equal to many countries in Europe. They were nationalizing and distributing oil resources. They were pushing healthcare, education, development. And this is part of the reason they had to destroy the country and to destroy Gaddafi. The same is true in Venezuela. The same was true in Burkina Faso under Sankara, and Congo under Lumumba, and Zimbabwe even under Mugabe. They see these countries not as objectively bad, they see them as a threat. Eritrea's rejection of aid in favor of national development, they cannot abide this. Mobilization of labor resources of the population, human capacity, building human capacity rather than being dependent on Europe and the rest of, the, uh, uh, the rest of these countries, rejection of what they call democracy in favor of improved living standards, in favor of all of these improved indicators of human development, they can't stand this. Upholding true human rights. Somebody said up on this stage, mm, I will not name names, but somebody said, well, they don't think that Eritrea is so important. Really? How about its location on the Mandeb Strait? How about the fact that a huge percentage of global trade goes through that strait? And wouldn't certain countries like to control whether or not Chinese ships get to go through that strait? Of course they would. This is part of their game. None of this, none of what I just said. I, I just made a bunch of basic points that is plainly evident to anybody who knows anything about Eritrea or about Africa in general, and none of this is discussed in major media. Why? The answer is because media, the major media, the corporate media, is part of that system I talked about at the beginning of this uh, speech. In the United States, if, if you were born and raised here as, as I am, you understand, hopefully, probably, that there's a monopoly on media in this country. Six corporations control almost all media outlets. And these corporations have interlocking boards of directors. Individuals who run these corporations go golfing together, go to their uh, friends, you know, children's birthdays and the like. They work together. They won't tell you that, but that's fact. You also have these state-funded media around the, around the world that executes the agenda of these state funders. And all of these institutions cannot talk about these very important issues. They cannot allow them into the conversation. They work to support and reinforce dominant narratives. Now think about what a narrative is for a second. A narrative is the story that is told. And they want to control the story that is told about Eritrea. They want to control how the information is conveyed so that they can control the way that people think about the country. And until you can change that, until you can break that control over thought and over narratives, Eritrea will continue to suffer in terms of the story that is told about it. You turn on the news now, and you see a lot of talk about, well, what's the, what's, what's the buzzword, what's the key word? Migrants, African migrants. Yet they often don't give you a context, do they? They don't give you the essential reasons for why this is going on. The role that the empire has played in destroying countries and pushing people to where they have no option but to get on a boat and try to make it to Europe or to, you know, be kidnapped by death squads roaming their countries such as you have in, in Libya, such as you have in Syria, such as you have in various places. The corporate media won't allow anti-imperialist voices. Now I'm standing here saying all of this Never in a million years would they let me say this on television, on any mainstream outlet at least. Certain outlets will, but they're not considered mainstream. They're considered mouthpieces of foreign governments or what have you, or independent media outlets in various forms. Now there's a reason why I'm pointing out this question of media and why I wanted to focus on it here in the closing part of, what, of my uh, discussion. I assume I'm not really paying attention to time. I assume that's the closing part of my discussion.
There's a reason why I'm pointing this out. Because the past before, well, all of us, but those of you in this room, is to become fighters. You're not simply here to say, I don't believe what they're saying. They're lying. Of course they are. But so what the hell are you going to do about it? There's a number of things that you can do. And, well, let me just say, first of all, they would love for you to believe that there's nothing you can do. Because as soon as you believe that there's nothing you can do about it, game over for you. You'll do what they, what they tell you to do because, hey, might as well live comfortably, do my thing, hope nobody bothers me, make it work somehow. This is a lie. That's what they would love for you to think. The reality is there's quite a lot you can do. First of all, one of the things that I try to do, and, I, and I'm certainly not the only one, we have comrades around the world who are doing similar things. Unfortunately, not too many of us, but there are some. Try to first utilize platforms that already exist. So as Elias said before I came up here, you know, I, I have managed to be able to kind of break through on some non-Western media outlets, RT, Press TV, CCTV, Telesur, and the like. These are outlets that are funded by institutions, governments, that are not part of that global system that I was talking about. Governments that are demonized. Pick up a newspaper and read what they say about Russia's President Putin to understand whether he is or isn't an enemy of the empire or how they see him. Take a look at what they say about Venezuela, what they say about China, what they say about Iran. These countries have media outlets, and it's our responsibility to utilize these media outlets as best we can to say, well, they're lying about a lot of stuff. And one of those things is Eritrea. And let me tell you the truth about it. Also, alternative media outlets, we have to utilize them, the ones that already exist. Uh, I managed to publish work in a number of what you could call alternative media outlets, independent media outlets. This is important as well. Understand this, the corporate media system is not going to be penetrated unless they allow you to get into their system. So the truth is, you could try to break down their narratives as much as you can on their platforms, or you create your own to counter the lies that they tell. And that's absolutely critical. Of course, blogs, various websites. The point here is, the things that I'm talking about, such as alternative media outlets, independent blogs, these are things that we can do. I did it. I could barely, I need to make a PowerPoint presentation. I could barely put it together on my computer. I have a blog. I have a, a website that I put together for z almost zero money. It manages to reach some people. I work at it. I put information out there as much as I can. I make friends with other people who do the same. I build networks, friendships, solidarity with people around the world. I will promote their work, they promote my work. This is how it works. This is how you penetrate a globalized system of media. You create your own and you do it independently so that nobody can come up on this stage and tell you, well, the national endowment for democracy doesn't really do all that much. <laughs> Sorry, that's a lie. They do quite a lot. And it's very dangerous work that they do. They work to destabilize and to destroy countries. That's why Russia has outlawed them. That's why China has moved to control all of these sorts of soft power weapons. And part of our work is to nullify them, to take the lies that they tell, the work that they do to destroy, and to turn it around against them, and to use it to build, to build solidarity networks around the world. Now, 
Many of you, I'm sure, most of you probably are on Facebook and Twitter and all of these social media out, uh, platforms, and they're very important as well. But understand also that they're controlled too. There are interests that control these platforms. Let me ask, well, I'm not going to ask you because you're not going to answer me, but let me just make a statement here. You don't control what comes up on your Facebook feed, do you? Whatever comes up, comes up. And I wonder why certain information never comes up, or very rarely comes up, because it's part of a control matrix. So you have to break that. You have to not only flood Facebook, Twitter, all of the rest of these things, of course, that's important, but you have to build your own independent platforms. You have to use them as launching points for independent organization and network building. So what's happening here, people are making friends, friendships that will last for a long time, that's important. But my question would be, so what happens when you're not all wearing the same t-shirt? What happens when you go home and you talk to people who don't know anything about Eritrea? Are you telling them or are you working to help them understand? Because it's very easy to tell people something. It's a lot harder to make them understand. But it's a lot easier if you've got a network of people around the world doing the same thing. And breaking that system of information control is absolutely critical. Now, I want to just finish up with one other point here. You have to make the connection between political war and information war. The empire stands in opposition in an attempt to destroy Eritrea. This is a fact. And in the information war, the corporate media stands in opposition to and in an attempt to destroy independent media. It's the same relationship. It's relations of power, it's relations of control, it's an attempt to destroy. So when you stand to defend Eritrea, you have to do so by defending your own media and blocking what the corporate system wants you to do. And just very briefly, personal networks are important. Friendships are critical. Solidarity building, not just within the Eritrean community, but solidarity building with other people in Africa, with other oppressed people around the world. This is absolutely critical if you want Eritrea to not only break out of the isolation, but to show that it is an example for other countries around the world and that it can stand against a system. So I'll just finish up by saying that part of what you need to do is to maintain contact, to maintain friendships, and to stand together not only in the times that are emergencies, but to stand together at all times with all the communities that you can and say, imperialism will never destroy Eritrea. Imperialism will never destroy Africa. Thank you. Please give it up for Eric. Thank you, Eric.